Thank you for being here. It's, uh, if, you're, if you're Swiss, it's lunchtime. It's with, if you're a good Swiss, when it's noon, you go and eat. That's the time for that. Now we're shifting it a bit, so thanks for being flexible. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. ApacheCon is always a great conference. I've been to this venue actually a few times for different conferences, and, and I love it. Um, so my name is Bertrand de la Creta. I'm a principal scientist with Adobe in uh, Basel. We have a R&D office in Basel for Adobe Experience Manager. Um, I used to be on the board of directors of Apache for 10 years. Stepped down this year to leave space for younger people. Uh, and uh, this topic is shared neurons. You'll find out uh, what it means, hopefully, as we, as we go on. Uh, this is an ant, obviously, it's not a maven. Um, it's, it's, an, it's nice, it's a nice animal, but on its own it doesn't do much. It's a small thing, has a very small brain, and you would feel, what can you do with that? It's, you know, it's just an ant. But if you put a few of them together, or many of them together, they start to organize and do uh, big things. Quite incredible things, if you look at a, a, big, at a big ant's nest. It's pretty complex and it works. Uh, because of the collaboration of these uh, small animals. And uh, with our community over code uh, motto, we're, we're a bit like that. You know, we have, uh, we have big or smaller communities, but we have communities or in, of individuals in our projects, and uh, they do amazing things. And I think uh, things that we could not do on our own you know, it's because of the exchange of ideas, the different points of view, the, the different uh, cultures that are behind our communities and our projects that, that make them, you know, allow, allow them to do things that are bigger or much bigger than what you could do if you were on, uh, on your own. Uh, this is me and a few friends on top of Kilimanjaro, uh, and it's a good illustration for uh, this African proverb. Uh, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And uh, some people do climb Kilimanjaro on their own. Uh, I don't know if you know about Kilian Jornet. Took like three hours something. Uh, our team took six days. But we got there. And we're not specific, you know, we're not incredible athletes. We just trained a bit and, and it was hard. But as a team, uh, you know, you can uh, lean on the others when, when it's, when it's tough for you and, and exchange ideas of how to make things happen. And I think it's the same thing happens in our projects. Uh, this, this term of shared neurons, I did not invent it. Uh, I remember it being used in the first times in the, in the Cocoon community. Who was, who's from the, we have anyone from Apache Cocoon? Not in this room. Uh, Apache Cocoon uh, was a fantastic community. It's, still is a community, but it was much more active in uh, the year 2003, 2004. A very, very active, very uh, balanced, very efficient community. And that's where we, we were using this term a lot of shared neurons. You know, we're putting our neurons together, putting our brains together to create something that's bigger than, than what any of us could do. Um, and, and this is the love song part. Um, actually, uh, if you, you know, love songs, they always talk about the same thing. But they do it in a different way. And, and if you want to compose a love song, the, the trick is to find how can I explain this thing that everybody knows about in a new way. And I'm doing a bit like, uh, I'm a bit doing that in my talks. If, if you've been to, to if you heard uh, some of my previous talks, it's maybe been 10 years or more that I'm talking about these things. How do we... What's the magic of, of Apache and open source communities? What's, you know, what are the ingredients that uh, can allow you to reproduce that in other settings or help, help you make your project work better? So it, like in love songs, I'm saying the same things uh, in, in different ways. And, and this shared neurons is kind of trying to find a new angle on, on the same thing. But we are geeks, right? So we want to... Uh, we don't need a definition of that. I cannot just, yeah, let's share neurons. We, we have to try to explain what, what it means. So what I mean by that is many brains getting together to create a greater whole. 
And I think we, we see that all the time in our, in our projects, where because of the rich discussions, because of the respectful ways in which you can make your point or, or argue with someone on a technical basis and disagree nicely, disagree constructively, and then in the end it's, you know, like the, if you look at the, the I'm not a brain specialist by far, but if you look at how, how neurons work, uh, there's a very large number of neurons in our brains, and they, they talk together a lot, a lot. There's lots of inter interconnections between these, these neurons. Um, quoting Wikipedia, some, uh, some types of neurons, they have over 1,000 dendritic branches, so connections, with tens of thousands of other cells. So they talk a lot, and they uh, if you look at the single neuron, it's probably not, not complex. It's a pretty simple thing. It's, it's a bit like an ant. It's, it can do something pretty simple. But when you put many of them together, that's when it starts uh, getting interesting. And I think we are reproducing that in our communities uh, many times. Which means that it's really about communication. Our, our individual brains, there's many uh, very clever people in our projects, but even then, uh, our brains are limited. And we tend to have one angle, one way of seeing things. And it's very beneficial to be, you know, to have other people um, uh, expressing ideas in a different way of, or expressing their own points of views which are different. And it's through communication that you can benefit from that. You know, if you, if you have different, uh, uh, different ideas of different pieces of the solution and you don't talk together, it doesn't happen. You don't, you don't find a solution. It's by uh, establishing good communication that it can, uh, it can work. And really, that's how we can uh, have many brains get together to create this, this greater whole. But we're geeks, right? So we need a... We need uh, concrete examples of that. I cannot just tell you, oh, it's just happening. Yeah, trust me. Uh, I think it's, it's probably useful that I show you uh, one example. Uh, it, it's a pretty simple example, actually, the, but there's tons of them in our communities. Uh, this is just one, one pretty small feature of the Apache Felix project. Uh, doesn't matter exactly what it does. What I'm getting at is the way the conversation is happening. And the way different people are, are, you know, providing different aspects of the solution. So this is about um, doing configuration, interpolation in configurations. You know, you, you have a config and you have a special notation, dollar bracket, variable name bracket, and this means replace this value dynamically, whatever. Uh, it, it's really not important what it does, but you have um, David Boschert uh, starts uh, in uh, item one, saying, hey guys, I, I've been working on this module recently. I have some ideas about how we can do that, so I have some, some initial code, uh, I put it in the repository, you can have a look at it, and I, I welcome feedback. And he's doing that pretty early. He's not saying, hey guys, I've finished this module, uh, you can love it, please love it, and please bless it, and we release it, and we're done. No, he's at the beginning of the process, says, I have something, but it's, I'm still open to suggestions. And I think that that's the starting point, being, you know, uh, exposing your ideas early and being open to, to contributions. And then uh, number two, that's JB, Jean-Baptiste Onofre, saying, oh, it's fantastic. I was thinking about doing the same thing. Uh, I did something similar in a different project, so maybe we can put our ideas together, and you already see something bigger emerging. You know, instead of just someone, David Boschert is a brilliant, is one of my colleagues, he's a brilliant engineer, but still, having someone else say, hey, I have the same problem, I did it, maybe you can, you can share our ideas. Then, number three, number two is me. Um, <laughs> I, I'm... I'm often quite picky on naming things. I think naming things right uh, helps a lot in design. I say, hey, David, you know, this is usually called interpolation. And I provide a, a Wikipedia link to that because we're geeks and we need to have facts to base on reasoning upon. So I say, hey, you know, I'm making a suggestion on the name. This doesn't make me a hardcore geek in that problem, but it's a useful contribution. And then number four, you have Gog Hensler. Uh, 
who's being uh, very precise, uh, discussing details about how, d how do you, should we do the exact syntax, you know, taking a totally different uh, angle on the discussion and also making a useful contribution. And, and with fact, you know, with uh, strong arguments on why he thinks we should do it in, in, the, in this different way. Then you have Carsten Ziegler um, uh, also making pretty deep uh, con considerations how you could do that. And then in the end, number six, you have David saying, oh yeah, okay, uh, thanks, thanks for your suggestions. I renamed the module as suggested. I've incorporated JB's ideas about uh, the framework system property based stuff, whatever. Uh, you know, uh, and, and I think that it's a great example, even it's a, if it's a small module in, in this project, it's a great example of a, of a greater whole emerging for this uh, respectful, constructive and open discussion where different people take different angles at the thing, say, oh, I think the name could be better. Another say, oh, the syntax could be improved, I have suggestions. And, and that's very powerful. You have the link, you can, if you want to follow the discussion, uh, you have the link to see the details. And this whole thing took 90 days. <laughs> Sometimes people say, yeah, you know, the Apache process, it's so slow, I need to agree with everybody. It takes ages. And, and 90 days, it can be seen as a lot. You know, if I do this alone, I could whip it up in two days and uh, it's good, okay, it works. Uh, in five years or ten years, you might be happy that you took these 90 days to get this design right. Meaning, you know, it doesn't bother you anymore, it's, it's clean, people like it, it's understandable, the names are good and so on. So I think we're trading the, the speed here for the quality of the result. And it takes time, which means it's a slow discussion. It, you know, maybe if during these 90 days people have gone on vacation or someone has been sick for a few days, it's interrupted, but still, you, you go, get together in asynchronous fashion and do something that's very effective in the end. Also have a counter example. I'm a, I'm a, cycli I'm a cyclist and a cycling fan, uh, so that, that's my example, that's my counter example. The first invention that led to the modern bicycle is the Velocipede in 1817, a pretty clunky thing which was not comfortable at all. You know, it's wooden wheels, so it's quite painful to ride. And then it took 53 years until the high wheeler was created with spokes, meaning that the wheel has some, you know, ca can do some, uh, um, how do you call it, a dampening of the, of, the, of the bumps in the road. But then, and then pedals, which are more efficient. But then if you have pedals and a small wheel, it's too slow. You know, it's like a kid's, wheel, kid's bike didn't work. So, oh, let's put a bigger wheel. And it worked, but it was kind of dangerous. You know, going downhill with that is a bit tricky. Uh, so, they, 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 okay, people said, oh, we should do something better. And it took 15 years to go to the safety bicycle, which is very similar to what we have today. A bit uh, heavier, maybe, than that like this nice Cipollini, which, where the frame weighs one kilo. Uh, but still, the basic design was here. But it took, in total, 53 years plus 15 years to get that. My point is that if these people have uh, had the communication uh, uh, tools that we have today, it might have been much faster. Because the, the exchange of ideas could be, could be faster, and I think we should take advantage of that and, and you know, really use these tools in, a, in an efficient way. We're geeks, so <laughs> we, need to, we would like to find out how do we do that concretely. So I have a number of... Um, uh, principles that we can apply in our conversations and our projects to make that happen. And it's based on the, on the observation that the neurons talk a lot. Uh, like we saw before, a neuron can have thousands of connections to other ones, so there's a lot, lots of conversation going on in our brain that makes this, this work. So the, uh, the, uh, the, the principles that I'm going to describe are really all about communication. That's, that's what makes this tick. And I will try to avoid speaking of tools. W exactly which tool you use to implement this does not matter. It's the principles that, that make the difference. And then you can, various groups might have different tools to do the same thing. The first uh, principle is to establish a constant flow of information. Um, if, you're, if you're working in a large organization, 
there's often very structured communication. Communication has to go through the managers and bubble up and then bubble down again. It's incredibly slow and it's incredibly painful. In our projects, we try to establish this constant flow of information where you have this big stream of information coming at you all the time, which means you need to learn how to cope with that. If, if you're active in, our, in one of our uh, busy projects, there's a lot of information coming in every day. Lots of mails or lots of get tickets or lot, you know, whatever, lots of notifications. Uh, that, and you have to learn to, to filter that and to cope with it. But the key aspect of that is that it allows everybody to get the same information. You have this flow of information, you can select whatever uh, is relevant for you, but it enables everybody to get the same information, and that's extremely powerful. It means people can work on the same, on the same, uh, you know, on same ideas and, and uh, not be segregated to just one thing as, as long as it's in the, in the flow of the project. And also what's important is that there is one flow. You don't have to look in 10 different places. In Apache projects, the usual rule is that everything has to happen on the dev mailing list. So if you want to know something, it has to be on the dev mailing list. Again, there can be different tools, but it's very important to have one place to look at and not 25. The second principle is to talk to the project. Of course, it's uh, faster and often easier, or it seems easier to talk directly to someone. Uh, the, the typical question that I see is, is who should I talk to, to, to for this problem? That's a wrong question. You should talk to the project. Imagine you're having a stand-up meeting all the time, and that's what you can do with these communication channels. Uh, if, if you have a, a one channel for your project, that's where the discussion is happening. If you have a question, you're sending it to, the, to this channel, even though you know that it's maybe Sean that's going to answer that. He's the one who knows, but still, people, others will be aware of the questions of the dialogue that's going on, and that's very important. Uh, and, and what's interesting is that if you work like that, this, you don't need any stand-up meetings, because the information is flowing, and everybody can get it. So if you have the luxury if, to be collocated, it, it's probably good to still do a short stand-up meeting if you can do that, but it's not required if this information is flowing uh, via the, the digital channels. But it's very important to talk to the project, avoid direct discussions, or if it's important, it has to be uh, uh, you know, in integrated in the project's discussion channel. The next principle is to share early and share often. We, we, off we, we also say release early, release often for code, and I think for ideas it's the same thing. If you share your ideas early, like we saw David do in our example, he was sharing, his idea was not finished. He said, oh, I have this idea, I, I would like to do that. Expose it very early, helps others give feedback. Uh, and, and maybe it will shape your ideas a bit differently. Uh, this year, term it uh, mounts. Uh, if you want to build a thing like that, you cannot build it in one, in one piece. It has to be built in very small uh, increments, you know, one, one uh, term brings a very small piece of it and then another one and it grows. And I think our ideas can grow in the same way by having very small contributions from many different people and then emerge, uh, let, then let something uh, bigger emerge. So sharing our ideas early, sharing them often allows others to give feedback and to shape the, the idea as, as, it's, uh, as it's growing. I wonder if anyone in the, in the room knows what this is? Or maybe I should ask that in French. Est-ce qu'il y a des francophones dans la salle qui connaissent les Shadox? <laughs> this is the Shadox. Uh, when I was uh, much younger, uh, this was on TV, and it's a, it's a crazy bunch of crazy animals. It's a cartoon that, that would air on the ORTF, the French television, in the, the early evening, like for three minutes or two minutes, very short cartoons, very crazy. And these are animals that are, are there on a broken planet, and they would like to move to the next planet, which looks much nicer. Uh, and the, the Professor Shadoko, which is their uh, chief scientist, has computed that they have a 0.02 uh, percent of chances to succeed. 
So he says, okay, so we should fail many times, and then eventually we'll get to the end of the set, and then we'll find this 0-2% which we, where we'll succeed. So let's fail a lot. And they're failing, they're just pumping to try to get to the next planet, and they're failing all the time. And uh, he says, you know, the more we fail, the more likely we are to succeed. I'm not sure that's how we should approach things, but still, it's very important to allow mistakes, you know, uh, and to be to be open, to be welcoming to someone making a honest mistake in, 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 the, in the project or, or, or having ugly code. Uh, if you saw the, the, movies, the fun movie screening yesterday evening, uh, Roy Fielding was saying that it, he was amazed to see, when he was seeing the code of other people, he said, that's not as, you know, I was a bit ashamed of my code, but I see that that code is not fantastic either. So I have no problem showing my code, you know, and, and we should not blame people if we see code that we don't like. Say, well, rather suggest something better. Say, oh, we can do this differently. Here's how we do it and, and give some code that, that explains how, how you want to do it. So I think it's very important to be uh, friendly towards mistakes. And also there are some cultures where it's very hard to make mistakes in public. When, if you do open source, you will make mistakes in public. Because, you know, everything happens on public lists or discussion channels, so your mistakes will be visible. If you, ser if you search for my mistakes in the Apache archives, you will find tons of them. Um, so, and for in some cultures, it's, it's something that people are not comfortable with. So we have to be welcoming and encouraging people, you know, telling people explicitly that making mistakes is okay, and, and you know, every mistake can be, can be fixed, uh, especially if it's software, you can, you can rewrite it better. So that, that's also an important uh, concept. The next principle is that code speaks louder than, than text, than, you know, than, than prose. Sometimes we love to write. When we want to explain an idea, we write a long text and, you know, trying to explain uh, how, we, how we're planning to do it and the different elements, and then you end up with a very long email. That pretty much nobody will read. We don't have time. Or when I see an email like that, you know, I'm kind of discouraged or, or I rarely have the time to really dig into it. If you can express your idea with code, do, do a crabby prototype, something that, you know, expresses your idea. It's so much more precise. People can run your code, even if it's ugly, if, even if it's not finished, if it's uh, just a partial solution it will express your idea in a much more precise way than a pile of text. I'm not saying you don't need specs. Uh, I'm not saying you don't need documentation. It's good to have that. But even for documentation, I prefer doing uh, overview documentation that explains the concepts, and then the details can be explained by test, test code. You know, readable test code is the best uh, uh, detailed specification because it, if it runs, you know that it, you know, it works and it's precise. So in many cases, we should try to avoid too long, uh, too long textual or too long conversations and write code, even if it's, uh, you know, temporary or, or ugly or not finished, it will uh, make it much easier for people to understand what you're, what you're about. Another key principle in our projects is to enable these kinds of slow discussions. In our example, uh, in the example that I was showing, it took 90 days between the, the initial idea to David saying, OK, I've incorporated the ideas. Here's what I consider to be a pretty finished version of my, my module. And it's a pretty small thing, you know, just replacing variables in a config. That's not, nothing big. Uh, so you could say that's way too long. And as I was saying, this, uh, I'm sure that this design is much better than David would have done on his own in one day, even though he's a very bright guy. So I think the, the way you set up your project, your collaboration tools, has to enable this kind of slow discussions. Meaning that if you're away for a week or two, you come back, you should be able to restart you know, where, where you left. Uh, and you shouldn't, you shouldn't have to have, shouldn't require to have meetings with people. We'll take a lot of time and we'll bore people to death just to get information. It should be in the system. And uh, for example, if you're working with tickets, uh, Git tickets or Jira or whatever, I said I, I, wouldn't, I was not going to mention tools, but <laughs> to give you an example of what I mean, 
uh, you know, the history of, of the conversation is here. You can go back and pick up, maybe ask a few detailed questions if you don't understand. But really, you have to enable this asynchronous uh, brainstorming that's happening here. Um, it's Dirk. Uh, Dirk is not here, but he was here yesterday. Who told me that I think it's the IETF, uh, one of the standards organizations. They do have meetings. They will meet for two, three days and discuss topics. Intentionally, they do not make decisions at this time. They say, okay, we discuss the issues, we, we, we discuss the possible options, but we postpone the decision to give people more time to reflect. And also for people who are uh, working in a language that is not their native language, we, you're working in English, my mother tongue is French, maybe in, in quick discussions, I don't understand all the subtleties. If it's in writing, I can take my time and understand clearly and, and reply you know, with better, better background. So I think it's very important to enable these slow discussions. There's a tendency these days to use chat tools uh, to communicate between engineers. It's cool, it's useful, but you have to realize that chat is a here and now medium. If you're using uh, you know, Slack or HipChat or these kind of things, it's great, it's very quick and efficient. But if, if you come two, three days later or one week later, it's very hard to make sense of what's going on. So you have to uh, you know, enable a channel where you can have these slow discussions for the important things and take your time to, to do a, a clean, a nice design. This is the last of these, uh, these principles, uh, which I'm calling quote precisely. So the, the most obvious example is in email. If you get an email, you know, you get a block like that, and you reply with stop quoting and saying OK or plus one, what are you exactly saying is OK? What are you exactly plus oneing? You know, maybe in this block of text, there's like 10 different concepts. And if you say plus one, OK, are you accepting all 10 or just one? It's very imprecise. Uh, but it's not, only, uh, it's not only in email that you're quoting uh, something that's been said. When you're commenting on code, uh, it's very good to have a tool where you can put, you know, position your comment very precisely on which line of code you are commenting on. If you are uh, discussing something in a ticket, uh, you can use quoting uh, mechanisms or symbols to express exactly what you are replying to. If, if you are having an in-person conversation, you will have lots of back and forth. You might interrupt someone, say, hey, I have a question, can I can I ask a question? If you're getting that in written form, it's, you have to indicate exactly you know, which part of the discussion you're replying to. So this is uh, the, the basic principle is the old style Usenet quoting. It doesn't have to be exactly like that, but the, the principle is that when you have a discussion, you're being very precise on which parts of the discussion you are, you are addressing in your reply. And I think these are the, 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 the tools, the principles that will allow you to uh, create this shared neural environment where you can share your ideas create, and create something that's greater than, than, the, than the parts or greater than, than the brains of the people who are involved. If you establish this constant flow of information, it will allow everybody to get the same information or filter out what they need and what they, what they don't need to, to you know, which parts of the conversation they need to participate in. Uh, the second picture was the uh, talking to the project. Instead of talking one-to-one -one with people, you talk on a channel where everybody in the project can see what's going on, be aware of the discussions, be aware of the topics that are going on. It's very important. The third image was the termit mounts was uh, sharing early and sharing often. As soon as you have an idea, that's you know, that, that's understandable, you should share it, even to say, I, I have just this vague idea. I think we should do that, it's perfectly okay. And do it in a constructive way so people can provide feedback and, and you know, steer shape what you are collectively uh, creating. The fourth image was the Shadox, who, who are failing a lot in, uh, you know, trying to eventually succeed. Uh, we sh Sometimes we do that without, without realizing, but I think it's really good to be welcoming to mistakes so that people can feel safe to in, a, in, a, in an environment where they are allowed to make mistakes and then people can see them and constructively uh, help fix them so that the, the, the result is better. Then we had the, uh, the code speaks louder, saying that don't write too much. You know, as soon as you can write some code, it's going to express your ideas much more precisely. 
Then we had the slow discussions, which are very important. Use tools that enable you to have these slow discussions. Uh, if you have to decide something in a meeting, that's often much less, much less efficient. Sometimes you have, okay, there's a deadline, you have to make a decision. But if you can, it's much better to, to take the time for the, the good ideas to emerge. And the last picture was uh, quoting precisely. Yeah, I didn't explain this picture actually. Uh, these people are using sign language. Sign language does work for, to communicate, and it's great. It's a great tool. It's not as precise or subtle as spoken language. And I think if, if you're quoting imp imprecisely, you're, you, you know, you're kind of reverting back to a less efficient language where it's, uh, it's hard to, to express things. So I think by using these principles, we can enable this, this sharing of neurons in our projects and create greater things. I'm seeing that... Uh, in action in, in, in the open source projects where I'm active. Uh, and, and then I think it's important to focus on that and don't be... Uh, when new tools emerge, you know, we, we had the number of new tools for communications recently, it's cool, but we have to put them in perspective. Do, do they, does, does the way we use these tools enable these principles? And maybe uh, it, it will help you define guidelines or define recommendations for how people should, uh, should communicate in your projects. So that's really my, my conclusion. So that uh, using these principles will allow you to uh, put the brains of your teams together to create a greater whole. And it's, I think we're seeing that in a fantastic ways in many of our projects. Uh, so it's, it's very encouraging. But we have to keep on our toes as communication tools and practice evolve to, to keep these principles alive. So we have, uh, I think we have a bit of time for questions. At least five minutes. Yeah. So if there's questions. Yes. We should take our time, and we're not good enough mm -hmm. at that. Um, but I have a teensy bone to pick with one of them. Okay. The one that's called, that you have labeled, code speaks louder. I completely agree on the principle behind it, but I have a bit of a problem because I am not a software developer. I'm an interaction designer, right. uh, one of the few involved in uh -huh. my software. And uh, although sometimes I submit code patches, my main contribution is of a different kind. Right. I provide um, prototypes, uh, yes. design of interfaces, and also I do research with the users of software to understand what they need. Um, right. So. Um, there are things that I can provide that are the equivalent to that code, mm -hmm. but I'm just wondering if it's time for us to be a little bit more perhaps open or inclusive and relabel this code that speaks louder to something else. That's a great that point. Speaks to that <laughs> contribution. Yes, thank you very much. That's a great point. So uh, I, I'm, I'm standing here with my background as a coder, and, and your observation is, is, is really perfect. Uh, so maybe I should say, Artifacts speak louder, or, or concrete, concrete uh, something. Yeah, that, that, that's a great suggestion. I agree totally. So in your case, I suppose what you're saying is that for you, providing a prototype speaks much louder than explaining what you're going to do, and that's probably what you do in your job. So, examples. thank you. Yeah. Examples. examples. Yeah, right. Concrete examples speaks louder than than long prose. Thank you very much. That's a great observation. It's the first time I do this talk, so it's great to have this kind of feedback. I can improve it for next time. Thanks. More questions or comments? <laughs> Sean. Yeah, I agree. Uh, great talk. Um, the one on allowing mistakes, um, to me, that's one of the most, that's one of the biggest barriers to getting people to join your project. Yeah is an unfriendly environment where um, you know people are afraid to come in. I know myself personally have been hesitant to to join projects for that very reason. I suspect that's what's behind you know somewhere in that diversity and inclusion uh, situation that has to be accounted for. Yeah. In my opinion. Totally agree. Yeah, I think that and I think that's a, it's a challenge because as you 
<laughs> as you become an expert, like, you know, if you start an open source project, de facto, you, you will become the expert on that after a few months or years or whatever. And it's, it's, it's difficult for newcomers to feel okay. Say, you know, I'm working with these guys and they are the, they are the experts in, in, the, in their field, so how, who am I to suge make suggestions to them? So I think, I, I think it's on us to, to make a constant effort to, to allow that. And maybe also be, be open about our own mistakes, because I know I do, I do many of those, so, so it's, uh, it's really, yeah, making, making the mistakes a natural part of the process and just not uh, uh, you know, being, being rude on the people doing mistakes or whatever. And then, as you're saying, there's the additional uh, culture uh, way. Some cultures, some personalities are don't, don't worry. I, I think, uh, again, I don't want to, <laughs> to do cheap psychology, but um, I was reading that people who are optimistic, I, I am an optimistic in general, uh, when something wrong happens, I tend to, uh, to think it's not my fault. I, t I tend to try to find external causes. You know, I was late. Oh, my, my, my alarm clock broke down. And whereas people who are pessimistic will tend to take that more on them. Say, oh, I'm late. That's terrible. Uh, and, and, you know, the, so the personality, the culture, the, 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 the groups you use to work with will influence that. And uh, yeah, I agree that that's a constant effort that we should make to be, to be welcoming to mistakes. More questions or comments? One in the back, yes. So, learning from the mistakes, so there are multiple kind of mistakes. One is just a code mistake, right? That's yep. easy. That, and there are other mistakes when the project doesn't follow the Apache way, or there are mistakes on this level. Mm -hmm. And when I'm interested to learn these kind of mistakes, and I prefer to learn from the other mistakes, right, before do. Right. But I don't know if there's any easy way to learn this part of the history of the Apache Software Foundation. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you were part of the board, and I'm pretty sure that you had a lot of problems, which are not published, or published in the board meetings, but I think it's, we have a lot of documentation about what should be followed, mm -hmm. but we have no examples that right. what should be avoided in, yeah, in the yeah. future. Yes, I, I, think, I think the examples are, are, are the key here. And uh, I would encourage all the, the Apache contributors, members, committers, whatever, uh, write your stories. When you have a good story or a story of a failure that turned into success, uh, please write, write about that. We have uh, multiple blogs in the Apache Software Foundation. There's a foundation blog which welcomes guest posts. Uh, there's, there's project blogs. There might be your own blog or Twitter or whatever. I think it's very important to... Uh, I, I think the stories and the examples will, will help with that. I agree with you that there's you know, many mistakes are being made uh, every month, maybe at least. Uh, and, and then we, we should learn from them. So uh, I think the, the documentation or more rules will not help for that in general. The rules are here and we try to have a minimal uh, amount of rules. I think that's good. But then it's the stories which will help, help with that. So, and that's uh, like if, if, you, if you're in an incubating project, I was a mentor for Apache Flex. And when Flex graduated, we wrote a small story of the incubation. You know, just a timeline, what, what went well, what went less well. And I think that's useful and, and it stays around. That's something that, that other projects can look at. So I think that everybody in the community can contribute to that by writing stories about, uh, yeah, mistakes or how things happen and how you can learn from that. Yes, Lars. So what uh, Lars is asking, what, uh, from the things that I mentioned, what the, what's the hardest or, or the, the most difficult to learn? Um, one thing that I, that I struggle a lot in the teams that I'm involved in, so uh, as I said, my, my, so my title in Adobe is principal scientist, it's kind of an internal consultant. So I consult with teams on architecture topics, but also on community and, and collaboration topics. 
And one thing that, that, that I see groups struggling a lot is the, the constant flow of, of information. It, it, feels, it feels so easy. You know, just say, okay, don't talk to people directly, or if you do that, send a small summary to the group's uh, digital channel. And people are reluctant to do that, or they don't care, or they, or they are lazy. I don't, know, I don't know what it is. But it's, it's, for me, it's, I was looking at our, uh, so we, we are using Slack internally to collaborate. I was looking at our Slack statistics recently, and the number of direct messages is huge. You have, you have a line that shows the messages uh, uh, exchanged on channels, so which, are the, which can be these kinds of constant flow of information, and then you have a line for the direct message. It's like, I don't know, 20 times, 30 times larger. People tend, seem to have a natural tendency to talk directly to others, maybe because they don't want to expose, they're afraid of making mistakes in discussing. I don't know, I don't know what it is, but that's where I see uh, I'm often struggling when trying to steer projects in that direction. Thank you for the question. So next thing is lunch. Uh, I think we're all eager to get, move to that stage. Uh, thank you for being here. I'll be around until tomorrow afternoon, so feel free to grab me if you have more questions. And thanks.